there was on. Didn't know I was on it on the air. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, to the Hags meeting for November, and appreciate your attendance. Uh, again, as uh, Mike mentioned and put in the notice, if you want PDHs, put it in the uh, chat log to everyone. Uh, so we'll get. I don't have any other uh, notifications or notices or anything. So we'll get right to the uh, the talk here uh, by Gary Flieger, and uh, appreciate Gary's stepping up to uh, give us the lowdown on this dam project out in Moraine State Park. Uh, if you've read some of the background, you wonder how the heck they would have even desired to try and build a dam in that geology. Anyway, Gary's going to tell us. Uh, Gary went to Bucknell University, got his undergrad there, got his graduate level at University of Illinois. He was the secretary and treasurer of the field conference of Pennsylvania geologists uh, from 1995 to for about 10 years. Uh, he it sounds like he had an un unbroken record of attendance to the field conference since 1975. Uh, congrats on that. A uh, internet search on him suggests he has his name on 81 publications at the survey. Uh, he retired after 22 years and has been living the dream, I'm sure, since uh, his retirement in 2018, but certainly he's uh, using that time to, to continue to review and uh, explore the Moraine State Park and help uh, the people out there on various projects, including uh, water supply and uh, historic, information and as as you read in the uh in the email on this uh found found a lot of information offshore uh for this place so uh i want to thank gary again and welcome to the meeting all right thanks ken uh Welcome everybody on uh, on uh, what day is this? Veterans Day, and I will try to see if I can uh, get my screen to share here. All right, is everybody uh, seeing my title yep. screen here? We see your title screen. Okay, good. Um, well, I got to do a Google search on myself. I didn't, I didn't think I had my name on that many things at the survey, but I'll have to go check that out. Yeah. Okay, see if I can get this thing to advance. There we go. Okay, a couple uh, disclaimers here. This presentation doesn't have any original work by me. It's an historical presentation of work that was done when I was anywhere from six months old to 14 years old. And I'm not an engineer. So it's an engineering works and I'm not an engineer. I'm gonna to try to restrict as much as I can to the, uh, how the geology affected uh, the siting, design and building of the dam. Uh, just a few things about Moraine State Park before we start into it. Uh, it was dedicated in 1970, so they had their 50th anniversary last year uh, and actually did a talk on the water supply system uh, January of last year as part of that 50th an anniversary. Uh, so this is kind of my second Moraine talk celebrating the 50 years. It's the third largest Pennsylvania State Park after Ohio Pile and Pima Tuning. 
uh, Lake Arthur is a recreation of a Pleistocene ice dammed lake. It's the largest lake built for a state park and the sixth largest lake in Pennsylvania after, if I can remember these now. Pymatuning, uh, Raystown, Lake Wallenpawpack, Allegheny Reservoir, Shenango Reservoir, and then Lake Arthur. It's uh, seven miles long and a, <clears throat> a mile wide. It's maximum depth or maximum width. It's maximum depth is uh, 30 to 35 feet and the average depth is about 11 feet. Uh, the current Lake Arthur size is roughly what's out, what's shown in blue on this slide. And the ice dammed Ice Age Lake uh, extended much further to the edge of the black outline. Uh, it was about, at, at the time the ice retreated and it started to drain about 70 feet deeper, or 70, the water level is about 70 feet higher than today's lake. And the lake bottom uh, is a buried valley filled with over 100 feet of sediment. So the depth of the glacial lake was probably around 200 feet. Um, the building, siting and building of the dam was just part of the initial uh, development of the park. So I'll just briefly mention some of the other things that had to be done before the park could be opened in 1970. 457 abandoned oil and gas wells had to be located and plugged. There's the, the Muddy Creek oil field, uh, kind of in the center of the park in the lake bottom and on the hills above it. 126 deep mine openings were sealed, 59 of which produce acid drainage. Uh, there's the location of the various deep mine openings. Most were on the north side of the valley because the structure is a general dip to the southeast and so they could all be uh, gravity drained, all those mines on the north side. Uh, and 19 strip mines or 800 acres of 19 strip mines, 500 of which were reclaimed and also 19 uh, Late, uh, waste banks were removed and buried in the abandoned strip mines. And this map, the dark, um, the dark brown areas are the strip mines and the black areas mostly on what's now the lake bottom or the waste piles. And there's a photo of one of the strip mines being reclaimed back in the 60s. Two highways were relocated and the park roads built. This is a superimposed 1974 prospect quad over the 1961 pre-lake quad. So you can see where the lake is and where the roads are. And so we had uh, State Route 528 over here in the Eastern part uh, that was relocated and a bridge built over the lake. And 422, which went right up through the uh, middle of the one finger in the main part of the lake had to be relocated over here. Does everybody see my pointer whenever I point at things? I hope so. I see it, Gary. Okay, good. Uh, a lot of infrastructure had to be relocated or installed in the park facilities built. Uh, this aerial photo from after the future lake bottom was cleared, uh, but not filled yet down in this area to the Southwest and the South shore was uh, the, the only park that was open initially. So that area had to be built. There were beaches and roads and picnic areas and so forth. And then the marina on the North Shore was the only part of the North Shore initially. Uh, water systems developed. Uh, initially, there were some wells that uh, were the source for the water supply. Then in 71, they switched to a um, surface water source and a water treatment plant. And in 2017, we built or we drilled a new Water supply well, which just went online in this past February. And so that's the wells is once again supplying water to the park. And of course, the topic of this talk uh, the dam being sited, designed, and built. So, the parts of the story, uh, I'm going to start with how I found this information. Uh, some time ago, I acquired a copy of this map uh, by the Department of Forest and Waters, who at, uh, ran state parks back in back in the 50s. And they had four uh, A, B, C, and D, four potential dam sites identified. And it wasn't built at any of those sites where the dam was actually built is where the red line is there. 
And so, uh, while I had my ideas as to why they weren't built in those four sites, I didn't know how they came about selecting the site they did. So I contacted the park manager and the regional engineer to see if they had any information in their files on the dam. Park manager had nothing in the park office and the regional engineer, all he had was a summary report from 1971, 70 or 71 by Ralph Peck and HO Ireland from my alma mater, University of Illinois. And it said in there, the selection of the precise dam, dam site itself proved to be difficult. A few hundred feet downstream from the selected site, the dam would have rested directly upon bedrock containing cavernous limestones. A few hundred feet upstream from the dam would have been underlain by several scores of feet of highly compressible lacustrine clays, which would have experienced large settlements. So it kind of gave a little clue about the precise location of the final dam site within hundreds of feet, but it never addressed this, this summary report did not address those early sites that they were considering. <clears throat> and uh, the summary report also mentions another report to report on the proposed Muddy Creek Reservoir in Butler County, Pennsylvania by Ralph Peck and Don U. Deer from 1964. So I was gonna see if I could find a copy of that report. So I did a Google search on Ralph Peck uh, who had passed away uh, some number of years ago. He was an internationally known geotechnical engineer, having consulted on more than a thousand projects around the world. Some of the projects he was involved with were the rapid transit systems in Chicago, San Francisco, and Washington, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And he was a colleague of Dr. Carl Terzaghi, who was the father of soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering. So he was very, very well known. Um, so the first place I thought to look to see if he may have filed some of his papers was the University of Illinois Engineering Department. So I contacted them. They didn't have anything from the days he was there. None of his papers, nothing left. Uh, I know that George White from the geology department at Illinois had filed all of his papers when he retired at the University of Illinois Library. So I tried there, but no, there was nothing in the library either. So I kind of ran into a dead end with Ralph Peck. So I thought I'd Google the other author of that report, uh, Don U. Deer. Uh, also from the University of Illinois. Uh, he was also a world-renowned geotechnical engineer. He was involved with the World Trade Center channel, the, the tunnel underneath the uh, English Channel, Cheyenne Mountain NORAD site. And he developed the rock quality designation index used today uh, by engineers, geotechnical engineers. And he received the Outstanding Contribution to Rock Mechanics Award from the American Rock Mechanics Association in 2012. So I thought, I'll contact the American Rock Mechanics Association and see if they have any uh, contact information for me. So I did, and they sent me an address. So I sent off a letter asking him about uh, the, the Moraine State Park files. And a few weeks later, I got a letter back from his daughter who said that the address I was given was her address, but she took the letter to her dad, who was an assisted, he and his, he and his wife were in assisted living. And she asked him about it. And he said, when he moved into assisted living some years earlier, he disposed of all of his files. So he didn't have anything either. So I thought, well, I'm out of luck. But then he said that Ralph Peck had a close working relationship with the Norwegians. And he thought that there might've been some papers of his filed at the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. So I contacted the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute and asked them if they had a copy of that report. And the next day I had a copy of that report on my, on my computer emailed to me. It was part of a complete file uh, on the Marine State Park project. And so I asked them to send me all of the information they had. So they sent me all of their information on that project, which besides the reports included extensive um, doc, um, correspondence between Dr. Peck, uh, Bureau of State Parks, uh, Michael Baker Jr. engineers, uh, and other agencies in the state. Um, so that's where I finally got all this information and why I had to contact uh, Oslo, Norway to find out all this information. Now the park has copies of all of this uh, so that they have it for their files again. So now before I get into the dam itself, we'll talk a little bit about the general geology of Moraine State Park. 
Uh, here's a structure contour map on the top of the Vanport limestone. Uh, those other marks are potential dam sites, which we'll get into a little bit later. But in general, uh, the park is on the southeast limb of the Homewood Anticline. So we have a general southeast dip to the rocks. Uh, the bedrock exposed in the park, uh, the hilltops are generally the Glenshaw formation, uh, the valley slopes and bottom to the east, the, the bottom beneath all the lacustrine sediments <clears throat> is the Allegheny formation. <clears throat> and in the western part of the lake and park uh, beneath the lacustrine sediments is the Pottsville formation, which if you look at published maps, it does not show the Pottsville extending this far east but I've extended it this far based on the water well data for our new water well from 2017, bridge borings and old dam borings. And uh, beneath all the lacustrine sediments, it does extend this far east. Uh, the glacial stratigraphy uh, in Northwestern Pennsylvania, there are a series of tills, uh, a couple of pre-Illinois age, a number of Illinois age, and then also of Wisconsin. The ones that are of most, that, that, co that cover the area that includes part of the park, the Mapledale, Titusville, and Kent. The Slippery Rock probably also uh, passed through the area, but there's very little uh, evidence left of its existence. It's almost all been weathered away. And here's a simplified uh, glacial map of Northwestern Pennsylvania. Uh, right there is where Lake Arthur Marine State Park is. So it's towards the southern end of the glaciated area right at the margin. Again, the, the light purple is the pre-Illinois and Mapledale. The darker purple is the Illinois and Titusville till. And the yellow and orangish are the end moraine and ground moraine for the Kent till to Wisconsin. And this is the uh, park in the lake with the details of the area, of what's been mapped. Uh, I don't know if this lobe right here of the Kent Till is accurate. It was mapped by Sittler in the 1950s based on constructional topography. There were some canes and eskers and so forth. And at the time he was mapping, it was thought that the Kent was responsible for most of the constructional topography. But it turns out their later work found that the Kent was just a thin uh, draping over the tight underlying Titusville constructional topography. So I'm not sure this Kent lobe exists at all, but this is reasonably accurate as far as I can tell for the Titusville border, which is what I, I think is responsible for the glacial lake, ice age lake. As the uh, uh, <clears throat> glaciers advanced into Northwestern Pennsylvania, they blocked streams that were flowing to the Northwest the main Pre-glacial drainage was to the northwest end of the St. Lawrence Basin and formed large lakes in advance of, of the ice front. Uh, as the ice advanced to the maximum position, it impinged upon the hills between the Slippery Rock Valley and the Muddy Creek Valley, creating two lakes, Lake Edmund to the north and Slippery Rock Valley and Lake Watts to the south and the Muddy Creek Valley with Lake Edmund uh, spilling over through a uh, low spot in the divide near West Sunbury and into Lake Watts. Lake Watts being controlled by the level of a uh, divide, low spot in the divide, uh, just in, in the eastern part of the lake. While the ice was at its maximum, it was about, the margin was right about along I-79, which is, this is I-79 here and 422 here. And it built a delta into the glacial lake, which is outlined here in yellow, approximately. So some of the places that uh, are well known at the park, if any of you are familiar with the park, Snyder Point, Mount Union Point, where the cabin colony is now, Snake Island, which you can see why it's called that, uh, Duck Point and the whole area around the dam. Uh, it's all a flat surface, uh, the remnants of this delta. And this pre-lake aerial photo, here, here's the dam after it's constructed over here. You can see this flat surface. Uh, this is uh, Snyder Point. This is where the cabins are now. This is now Snake Island. Duck Point is over here. And this is a, a uh, shoal, a shallow shoal uh, connecting Snake Island to Duck Point. 
And those are all remnants of the surface of the delta. And in fact, over here, you can see, I don't know if this is the delta front or if it's an erosional front. Uh, having been eroded by Muddy Creek, but you can see the front of the delta right there. In fact, in this aerial photo, I forgot to point out, you can see it. This is that shoal, and you can see it, the front of the delta going down into deeper water in the lake today. <clears throat> so while the glacier was there blocking the stream, Lake Watts existed. As the ice started to retreat, it opened up successively lower passes which would partially drain the lake in, in phases. Um, when we got to the final opening, so it had a clear drainage to the south and drained most of Lake Watts, is still a small part, a remnant left in the basin. And the reason for that is that pre-glacial Muddy Creek flowed out to the north here in this blue line, and it was filled with lacustrian and deltaic sediments. So it, it was blocked even after the ice retreated. And there was a north-south bedrock hill ridge coming up through here. And the lake started to drain through a low point in that, in that ridge and eventually eroded through draining the lake. And that created the Portersville Station Gorge, which comes into play in the selection of the dam site in a little while. OK, geological controls on siting the dam. Here are some of the dam sites. I, there are at least 15. I don't know where all of them are. G and I have never been able to locate. Uh, and the reason, and also D, there's two Ds that are from two different reports, one in 1956 and one in 1958. 1956 report uh, was by Shaler Philbrick, which many of you may know that name from the Corps of Engineers for many decades. And the 58 one is from the Department of Forests and Waters report study that was done. So the reason I don't know where G and I are is that this, in the 1964 report, it says here, the, it is assumed that the reader has access to the documents entitled Report of Preliminary Subsurface Investigation of Proposed Dam Site, dated February 62 and September of 63. These were prepared by Michael Baker Jr. Incorporated I figured if I was able to find all those reports and uh, correspondence in Norway, this should be easy to do because Michael Baker Jr. is just down the road from uh, Moraine State Park in Beaver County. And I could just easily contact them and get copies of those. Well, I contacted them and they cannot find any of those reports, either of those reports anymore. So somewhere in there, they identify, I'm assuming, sites G and I and why they're not, not being considered anymore by the time this report was written in 64. Uh, let me see. Okay. Site B, a cross section, most of the sites, H, B, the two Ds, C, F, and E, would have all had fairly similar cross sections. Which this is B, site B. Uh, the orange line is the elevation of the current Lake Arthur. Um, here's the current lake bottom. And this is the cross-section theory. And you can see it's filled with over 100 feet of lacustrian sediments and maybe some older, older sediments above bedrock. Uh, the lacustrian clay and these post-glacial alluvial sediments would not have made a very stable foundation for a dam. Um, so they really didn't want to have to use one of those sites. Uh, there's a, a photo of some of the lacustrian sediments. This was taken from a slump road cut, which is why they're all distorted like that. But you can see the fine grain clays and the slightly coarser silts. These are probably in, in annual vars originally. Now the dam sites can be separated into two groups from B and on east and then this group up in the northwest here. And the difference, the, the reason it's separated into two groups is US 422. US 422 had opened in 1950. And by 1956, they were looking to build a dam that would flood it and re require them to 
relocated. So they weren't sure if they were going to be able to get convinced the Department of Highways, as it was at that time, pre PennDOT agency, to relocate a major highway that was that new. But as it turned out, 420, old 422 was three lanes with passing in both directions. And that passed through this very swampy, flat lake bottom, which had a lot of trouble with fog, which was not very good for passing in the center lane from both directions. So they were able to convince uh, the Department of Highways that it would be in their best interest to relocate the highway. So once they did that, they were able to eliminate all of these dam sites from consideration and look at these ones in the northwestern part of the what's now the lake, the park. So we had A, J, H, and H prime. And uh, J, K, L, and M. The actual dam site is site M with L and M, or K and L in between J and M. So that's why they're not all shown on here, just too many. Um, but then they considered H and realized that the subsurface geology was a similar, similar there to what it was at B and it would be an unstable foundation, which they could have um, accounted for, uh, but it would have been a lot more difficult, a lot more expensive, much larger dam. So they decided instead of H, they would consider H prime, which would partly, uh, cross over the deltaic sediments, which were more stable and only a small section over the lacustrine, directly on the lacustrine sediments. And here's that same photo again, aerial photo, where H would have been over here beyond the end of the delta, H prime crossed the delta, and then this little piece across the lacustrine sediments here. And there's just a photo from the excavation for the sewage plan a few years ago, uh, showing what the deltaic sediments are, are like. They're much much sandier and much uh, more stable than, than the lacustrine sediments. <clears throat> so we now can divide the remaining dam sites to uh, what was actually J here and A versus H prime. And the difference between that is that H prime would not have flooded this area in the northwestern corner of the lake. Uh, and the reason that was a problem, if, if you look at the structure contours here on the top of the Vanport limestone, you'll see that the, there's 1,200 feet at the, at the northern tip of the lake here, and there's a 1,200 foot uh, structure contour at the top of the Vanport. They were concerned that if they build it at A or M, that, they, that the, the lake would have too much leakage through the cavernous Vanport limestone. It's, it's a very cavernous uh, limestone. In fact, the largest cavern cave in the state, the longest yeah, cave in the state, is several miles to the Northwest here at Harlandsburg Cave. So, and you can see where Lake Arthur is today. This is a cross section I did for the water well we put in in 2017. Um, the Vanport limestone is right at the level of Lake Arthur at this northwestern corner of the lake. And in fact, there's a photograph of the shoreline of the lake in that northwestern corner. And you can see the dissolution along the fractures and the bedding planes is quite extensive. So what they did is they decided to map the Vanport in detail, as much detail as they could on the bottom of the Vanport, because they wanted to see if the Vanport rose enough towards the anaclinal axis uh, to get completely above the lake. I'm assuming this was a mylar overlay of topo maps because there is no scale, there's no north arrow, there's only one geographic location identified and that's West Liberty up here. Uh, so I'm assuming based on all of that, that this is the corner of the four seven and a half minute quads that this would cover. But based on West Liberty being there, and the elevation at the lake, I'm uh, interpreting that the lake would be right here and that indeed the Vanport to the west does exceed the 1190 foot elevation of the lake all the way along here so that the 
water would not leak out through caverns in the Vanport limestone. So they decided they were able to flood that northwestern corner and they eliminated H prime. So now they have A and J left and A was always the favored site from the beginning. And the reason for that is it was a much, it was a narrow gorge, so it was a much shorter dam and it was founded on bedrock. Uh, so it would be a much more stable foundation. And if you recall from this photo, the reason it's narrow and founded on bedrock is it's in this uh, post-glacial diversion gorge that was eroded through here. So here's the cross section when I did exploratory work uh, for uh, site A, and you can see it's on bedrock, but some of the bedrock in the abutments of the future dam, the red is the level of Lake Arthur today, 1190 is again on the Vanport limestone, which is cavernous. And so it was a concern that there would be too much leakage through the limestone around the dam, through this north-south ridge and out the other side, and they might have a hard time maintaining the level of the dam. So they eliminated site A and they chose site J. <clears throat> so at that point, they started a phase one exploratory, detailed exploratory drilling for site J. And based on that, they decided to move it 50 feet further downstream, which was site K. And then they started explore, phase two exploratory borings for site K, which is site, well, site J is out about here. And uh, based on those exploratory borings, they moved it two more times, a few you know, tens of feet each time to get just the right combination of Lacustrian sediment over bedrock so they'd have a relatively stable foundation, but the bedrock would be covered by lacustrian sediments that would help prevent leakage into the bedrock. And uh, this is a cross section I built on the final location of the dam. You see you have the deltaic sediments across the top with lacustrian sediments at the bottom and towards the south end, you do it, it does get into bedrock. Uh, a little bit of the Vanport limestone and sandstone shale and siltstone under that. Uh, this line is the top of the bedrock surface and as you, it dives deep into the pre-glacial course of Muddy Creek as you go to the north. All right, so that's why the dam is where, where it is today. That's how they decided on that location. <clears throat> but they had to take into account the geology on the designing of the dam also. First thing they had to do was decide to put in a grout curtain beneath it because the bedrock beneath the dam was fractured and they were concerned of too much water leaking through fractures beneath it. So they went down about 30 feet beneath the dam and put in a grout curtain. And this is the location of each of the drill holes for putting in, putting in the injecting the grout for the curtain. And again, this is site J K and L are in here somewhere, and then M is the final dam site. And the green here shows the extent of the grout, the depth of the grout holes to put in the grout curtain to prevent leakage underneath. And you can see as you go further to the north, uh, the rock surf surface plunges deep uh, into the pre-glacial mm -hmm. valley of Muddy Creek. The Grout curtain would cover this much of the dam, that's outlined in green. And then they were going to excavate. Actually, I think I, yes. They excavated to this line through the, whatever material was above it in places where the bedrock was shallow, they excavated from the original land surface down to bedrock. And then they put a, a core trench uh, down through the center which would be filled with an impervious material. And that core trench, the cutoff trench is outlined in red, the area would be covered with that. The part in between is down to bedrock and the part beyond that is where you're getting deep into the valley of Muddy Creek. And then they also decided within the core of the trench that they would install Wakefield pilings, which are interlocking wooden pilings that are watertight and permanent. And they would go over in this area down to bedrock and over in this area 
where bedrock was deeper, far enough into the lacustrine sediments to prevent flow from under the, under the dam. And then they installed a series of 24 nested piezometers, which are noted in blue here, uh, where they would monitor for water flow through the dam in case there was any piping and mostly under the dam to measure the upload pressures or up, uh, yeah, upload pressures uh, under the dam to prevent uplift of the dam. And here's just a cross section of one section of the dam showing the design. You had the core, um, impervious core, and in this trench that was filled with the impervious core, they put in the Wakefield piling down to bedrock in this, at this position. And they put a pervious shell around the outside of it. And then on the upstream slope, there's an impervious blanket with um, riprap above it and riprap down here where there's stream stream cut down there. And you can see the levels of the piezometers beneath the dam to check for uplift pressures. One of the things that Ralph Peck mentioned several times in his in his correspondence is the design of the dam isn't complete until the construction of the dam is complete. Uh, because as they start excavating and building the dam, they're going to encounter conditions that hadn't been predicted based on the drilling program. So that would affect, uh, require a change in the design of the dam. And there were a couple of those. Uh, the dam, Michael Baker Jr., as I said before, is the engineer, John Rowland is a general contractor, a full graph electric, electric contractor. Uh, the groundbreaking for the dam was December 2nd, 1965. A.J. Caruso is the secretary of the, um, oh, I can't think of what it is now, General Works or something like that. Henry Harrell, Department of Highways. Charles F. Lewis was the president of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, who was very instrumental in the development of this park. Maurice Goddard was the secretary of the Department of Forests and Waters. Michael Baker, Jr., the president of the engineering company, and Bill Rowland, the president of the construction, primary construction contractor. So the first thing they did was drill for the route curtain. You can see the, uh, the stakes here that identified the location of the future dam and they had to put in holes for the grout curtain. They rerouted Muddy Creek around where the, where the spillway was gonna be. This is the north wing wall of the spillway and this is the south wing wall over here. And they excavated to bedrock in the center here so that the, the concrete spillway would actually be uh, set on, on bedrock, on a bedrock foundation. And when they got there, they had to modify it somewhat because they found the bedrock at the surface was somewhat, the top of the bedrock surface was somewhat weathered and wasn't a good foundation. So they excavate deeper and modify the design of the spillway to go a little bit deeper. And then they backfilled it up to about this level, which you can see in this photo down here, they're working on, on putting in the backfill. Now here's the core uh, trench with the Wakefield piling uh, being driven into it. But there was a problem with the installation of the Wakefield piling because of the geology underneath. The, the piling was being driven into lacustrine sediments and those lacustrine sediments would dewater very slowly. So they would drive a piling in and the increased pore pressure in the sediment would just push it right back up again, it would rebound. So first they tried a change in construction method where instead of driving one piling in the whole way, they would go and drive each one in just a small amount. And when I got to the end, they would go back to the beginning and drive it in a little bit further. And I think that helped a little bit from what I've read but it still did not stop the rebound because it, the, the increased pore pressure from driving the piling in just couldn't be uh, released fast enough through the lacustrine sediments. So they eliminated some of the Wakefield piling, but not, not too much. And then what they did instead is they extended this impervious blanket that just went as far as the riprap, the rest of the way down the face of the slope, the upstream slope of the dam. And here's a, a photo of the uh, dam with the impervious blanket extending down below the riprap on top. 
All this was caused because they couldn't get the, the custard sediments to the water fast enough. The, this is a piezometer trench. All those 24 nested piezometers had a line. You can see the hydraulic lines here running and went into a subsurface within the dam room that uh, had all the gauges for all of the piezometers. And at this piezometer well, this is it showing right here. And that's, that's the view looking down. You can see all the lines from the 24 piezometers coming in uh, to there and the electric line coming down. And then they had the gauges for each of the piezometers here, the lines coming in from the picture, the view we just saw a minute ago and into the gauges. And they could, they could keep track of the pressures and all of the piezometers all in the one location in this piezometer well. Now they haven't used the piezometers. Once the lake was filled and there were no uh, leakage or uplift pressure issues, uh, I think a year for a year or so after the lake was filled, they, they stopped monitoring the piezometers, but they're all still there. Don't know if they work anymore or not. So here are a few construction sites. This is the north wing wall and the south wing wall early in the construction of the, uh, of the dam. There's, that was going to become the piezometer well right there. And this is a trash rack that prevents debris from getting into the sluice sluice passage there. Now you'll notice in this one, there's a, they're, they're building up the face of the spillway, but there's a section that they hadn't put in here. Here, the spillway is mostly done. They still have not filled in that one section of the spillway. And here's when the rest of the dam is completed because the embankment is, is finished or they put in the, the control house at the top. And uh, this section is still missing. And there is a reason for that. 420, while the dam was being built, 422 relocation was being built. But until that completion, that relocation was done and four, old 422 is abandoned, they couldn't complete the dam. Because if that dam had been completed and the, the only pathway for Muddy Creek to flow through it would be through the sluice gate. And if they ever had a flood, that exceeded the capacity of that, that uh, sluice gate, it would start backing up behind the dam and flood 422, old 422, while it was still being used. And indeed, that's exactly what happened in late January, early February, 1968. And you can see the water is backing up behind the dam and pouring through, and that's why they couldn't finish the dam until after 422 was open. So once 422 is open, then they could work on completing that last segment of the spillway and the whole dam would be complete. And there's a photo of the uh, completed dam there. May 15th, 1969, they closed the gates of the dam and started to fill the lake for the first time. And uh, here's, here's the dam while, while it's filling, uh, fairly early in the stages, it's been in the summer of 69. This area, this light area behind the dam here was a small limestone quarry. And when they excavated for the, the dam, that's where they placed all of the fill, uh, was the filled in the, the quarry. Uh, again, you can see the, the delta surfaces at the various places on this photo too. But what I wanted to point out here were a couple of places. The impervious core for the dam was stripped from the surface of this hill right here, you can see that where it was stripped off here. And the pervious shell was taken from a sand and gravel quarry over here, right at the glacial border. Uh, again, there's the area that was stripped for the impervious core and for, for the pervious shell. And here's the lake as it's filling with old 422 going across. This is obviously very early because it hasn't flooded old 422 yet and new 422. Um, this is a mile or two upstream and it's just starting to overflow its banks here as the lake's filling. Uh, you can see this is the South Shore uh, beach here. A uh, couple of places I mentioned about the, uh, what, 500 of 900 acres of strip mines had been reclaimed. Well, two places that were not reclaimed are right here. This is an old strip mine that today has a trail, the Sunken Garden Trail. It runs between the waste piles 
and the high wall, the old high wall. And I don't think many people that hike back there realize it's a an abandoned strip mine, unreclaimed abandoned strip mine. And this main uh, day use area road going around the hill here, looks like there's a road cut right along it. That is also an abandoned strip mine high wall uh, that was left in place. That's a photo of it right there. I think they should have a <clears throat> informational sign there just talking about it, but maybe I'll talk them into it someday. So as the water rose up over old 422, you can see where it comes out of the water there and there's new 422 bridge on the left edge of the photo over here. The people love to come out. I remember doing this myself. Uh, people would drive out in 422 as far as it could go. They'd play in the water on the whole highway. There's, there's where the highway came out of the water over there in the left edge. And they would even launch boats and started boating long before the lake was filled. They would just go out 422. This one is a little bit later after that section of 422 has been flooded, but the lake's still, still filling. And on April 3rd, 1970, water flowed over the top of the spillway for the first time. Here's a graph of the filling of the lake. This line going from lower right to upper left shows the um, area covered as the lake was filling. This one shows the volume of the lake as the lake was filling. Now you can see if you come up here, this change in slope here indicates that the lake started filling faster at about, uh, looks like around August, September, October of 1969. And if you look, it took 10 and a half months for this lake to fill. The first half took eight months to fill and the last half in two and a half months. So, and, and this change in slope indicates that through time, it started filling faster. Now, I always assumed that meant we had a very wet year that year, or at least the wet winter and spring. But if you look at the graph of cumulative precipitation from May 15th to April 3rd, you'll see that it's this green line here is that year's precip cumulative precipitation. It was actually a below average uh, year. And that seems strange because they expected it to take 18 months to fill and it only took 10 and a half months and it was a below average year in precipitation. So I'm not sure. The only thing I can figure is that perhaps there was a snowpack that melted late in the year and that increased it because the lake actually rose its last six and five eighths inches in the last 24 hours before it, it filled. So, so that's the story of why the dam is where it is and how the geology affected its siting, design, and, and construction. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Is anybody still there? Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my, my microphone went uh, crazy there for a second. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, so the normal format for this is folk um, can type in their questions in the chat uh, and uh, then I'll kind of curate them from there. Although it is also possible if you, uh, there is a like a raise your hand function um, and I can, uh, I can call on you. Uh, I don't know why there are such big name geologists. I was impressed by that too, because those two guys were world famous uh, and did thousands between the two of them of consulting jobs worldwide. Are there any soil and rock logs remaining? I'm not sure what soil and rock logs we're referring to. Oh, of the, of the, from the, from the, uh, Dam exploration. Um, I have the logs. The cores were stored in a, an old barn on the site for many for a number of years afterwards, and I have some correspondence where the park manager asked if he had permission to dispose of them back in the early seventies, which he did. So none of the 
none of the cores exist, but we do have the logs uh, for the coring uh, for the dam exploration borings and also for, for those initial four dam sites that were never used. And also for the 528 and 422 bridges for their relocations. Recreation, what, yeah. recreation was the purpose. Um, it, it does have a little bit of uh, flow control, but that's not the purpose. If you look at this, at the gauge of the, the USGS stream gauge on Slippery Rock Creek at Wurtenberg, which is below the confluence with Muddy Creek, there were 13 times, 13 years where the flow of Slippery Rock Creek exceeded 10,000 CFS between 1912 and 1969 and only one time since 1969. That was during Hurricane Ivan, maybe, I can't remember for sure, back around 2004. So it has, it has resulted in some flow control, but that was not the purpose. The purpose was recreation. No, I don't take any credit for it, Cliff. I, I didn't do the work. I just went and looked, went and found it. Uh, Kent asked, did the construction photos come from the record you got from Norway? No, the construction photos actually are in the park office. Um, they have about 3,000 historical photos, which a year or two ago, I borrowed from them and scanned them all for them because they were all uh, slides. And so they weren't doing anybody much good stored in three ring binders in the park office that nobody even knew about. So I scanned them all and that's where those, those construction photos came from. Did they have to excavate in front of the dam? They, they, uh, they did not excavate in front of the dam except where the, where the intake channel is for the sluiceway is not where exactly where Muddy Creek originally flowed. So there was excavation there uh, approaching the dam. Uh, and so you may have seen riprap on the side of the dam that suggests they, they had excavated and they did at that location. But other than that, there was no excavation in front of the dam. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's easy to, to research what everybody else has already done. The general quality, well, when uh, there, there are no real impacts from mine drainage today, when the lake was first built, they were concerned that there would be, and that's why they attempted to uh, supply the, wa the water supply from the park for the park would be from wells. Uh, but the water, if you saw my talk a year ago, two years ago, this coming January on the water systems, um, the wells often have very poor quality and often low quantity also. And so they used them for a while, but they were bringing in the National Boy Scout Jamboree at Moraine State Park in 73 and 77. And the wells were not going to be able to supply the amount of water that was needed for 50,000 scouts. So they built a surface treatment plant and they determined that the quality of lake of the raw water from the lake was adequate that they could build a surface treatment plant. And that's what they've used since 1972 until this year. And the reason they replaced it this year is because simply the life of the surface treatment plant was uh, at the, it was at the end of its life and they were either going to have to find another source or build a new surface treatment plant. So instead of spending a million dollars for a treatment plant, the park manager asked me if I could uh, suggest a location for a well, which I did and it was very successful and it saved them a million dollars, which they then applied to rehabilitating the entire water distribution system through the park. So the water quality of the lake is, is actually actually good. I was actually not being an engineer. I was kind of curious about that too, but the, um, 
the documentation uh, indicated that these Wakefield pilings, these interlocking wooden pilings are watertight and they are um, permanent. Now, I'm not sure how long permanent is. The uh, dam's 50 years and it's still doing fine. Um, they did consider using steel pilings, um, but they felt that the wood was better. And I don't recall seeing any, any discussion of a grout curtain within the dam. The only grout curtain was beneath the dam. That was uh, one of the best researched talks we've, we've, I think, ever had or that I've seen. So thank you again for that. You're very welcome. I've enjoyed doing it. If anyone uh, wants to ask uh, any last questions, uh, please uh, sh uh, type it on in. If anybody thinks of any questions they want to ask me later, there's my email. Wonderful. Send me a question by email. Well, uh, thank you so much. I'm going to give it to uh, Kent to, to uh, uh, close us out here. Thanks, Gary. Again. Uh, as Mike said, one of the the research there is a, you know fantastic. The story in, interesting, and uh, yeah, I've always loved a good dam sighting project. But some of their and and I love the idea that engineers would be able to adjust as construction takes place. Uh, that sounds like a new concept to me from personality uh, differences. It's, it's, it's a damn good story. Yeah, really. And uh, the wood pilings, <laughs> I love that. Uh, that. That one surprised me too. That was yeah, the biggest not surprise. Being able, not being able to drive them in and have them springing back. It's like, yeah, but uh, it sounded like they persevered through it. Good thing they don't have woodworms down there. Yeah. Uh, again, appreciate your uh, wonderful research. I'm, I'm sure, hopefully, you'll be able to uh, take this talk on the road or give that presentation other than just our little group. Well, this is my second time. I, I did the Pennsylvania Council of Professional Geologists also. Oh, great. That's great. And uh, again, appreciate your time and and putting this together. How, no, you're how long did this take you to, to research and sleuth? And sounds like, I, you know, obviously you worked on the, uh, the water supply thing. I remember that presentation. And, uh, and obviously you grew up in this park or, or around this park. So yep. I, I guess it's been a 30 year project, huh? Yeah, pretty much, but uh, I've always wondered about why the dam was there, <clears throat> but once I, once I got connected with the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute, and, and all the dam, the plans and maps and everything are, are at the park office, so I have scans of all of those, too. Yeah. When, once, I, once I got in contact with the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute, the, only took, the time it took me was the time it took me to read through all the files they sent me. Which were probably extensive and uh, probably not too easy to read with all those little dots for, uh, for the well, That's why there. I said at the beginning, I, I'm not an engineer because there was stuff <laughs> in there that I didn't quite follow because it was pure engineering. Well, it's interesting stuff. And uh, yeah, hey, thanks. There's, there's an answer to your question about the uh, wood piling. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And all have a good night. And uh, we'll see you next next month. And uh, I guess it's it's now time for me to next month is my turn to put together something for you. And hopefully I can get close to what Gary put together here.
Okay. Oh, there's, there's one one more question just came through. Hold on. All right. Are there any operating piezometer recording recording water level on the downstream side? Yeah, there were some on the downstream side of the dam. Uh, they were they were beneath. Most were within or below, and some were downstream. Uh, so yeah, they they had a series of piezometers uh, all all over the place to to check that. And, and the park manager actually next next Friday, I'm, the park manager is taking me uh, into the piezometer well. I asked if I could go look in the piezometer well to see. I don't know what kind of condition it's in down there anymore because uh, they haven't used it for fifty years. And also into the control building where they control the gates of the dam. So that's my tour for next Friday. I that was one of my questions which you answered, which was, does anybody check these anymore? No. <laughs> No, I asked the park manager, and he said no. Yeah. They, I, I, and on that summary report by uh, Ralph Peck and HO Ireland that I initially found, um, they indicated that everything was performing satisfactorily with the piezometers, and so they suggested one more time the next spring during the maximum wet period, and then again a month after that. And then as I said, after that, you can discontinue the piezometer. Uh, monitoring. So I assume that I assume that's the last time it was done in 1971. Wow. <laughs> Not even during a real heavy uh, flow or anything, huh? Yeah. I, I'll have to ask the engine the regional engineer to see if they ever ever look at them again. But maybe I'll maybe I'll find out next Friday. It's probably it probably had a 50 year design life, so it should be up on the uh, on the board for review and rehab if necessary. Well, there's, they're, they're hoping to be able to get some work done on it in the next few years, but it's, it's okay. inspected every year by the dam engineers and it's performing just fine as of yet. Yeah. So. Well, I'm, I'm aware that, you know, of course <laughs> in the fifties and sixties, the Corps of Engineers and everybody else had a big big thing for flood control dams and they built a bunch of them and then yes. they revised the regulations which made many of those dams out of code and non-compliant which now when they're all at their 50-year design life are on the list for either breaching or reconstruction and uh, so it's kind of a, okay, that's, <laughs> yeah. why'd they revise the code after they built all the dams, but that's. that's no, they probably cool. learn, learn from them. <laughs> yeah, yep. Well, I think um, the one I'm familiar with is they didn't really regard the seismic risk in Pennsylvania the same as they do now. Right. So, that's that's the reason, and uh, it's yeah, it, it has an impact on some dams. So, all right, all well, right, again. Thank you. See see you next month. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to end the meeting right now.